Happy Father's Day. Okay, that was awkward. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Today, I want to talk about a very sensitive topic that I actually don't want to talk about. It's, it's interesting that, believe it or not, it's difficult for us as priests to preach on difficult moral topics, especially because in addition to sometimes fearing being unpopular or fearing people judging us harshly or fearing people even mistreating us and yelling at us, and yes, that has happened. It happened to Father Joe. We as priests have multiple reasons why we sometimes draw back from addressing difficult moral topics. The main one, though, is that we're concerned how people are going to receive it. No, no matter how much love we have, no matter how gentle we are, we're concerned that some people who struggle, and we all struggle with things in the faith, we all struggle following Jesus in one way or another, we're afraid that those very struggles can prevent people from receiving the truth that God wants them to know and that we're trying to preach. And what makes matters worse or more difficult is that the very thing that we preach on sometimes can be so challenging for the people listening that the very struggle they have prevents them from hearing that truth. And this has happened often over the years when I've preached about putting our faith over politics. Now, most of you know I did my master's integrating seminar on this topic. And so when I talk about having God first and our politics second, and we need to order our understanding of politics through the lens of our faith, most often the people who come up and disagree with that and have a very hard time with it are the very people who have politicized their own faith and they don't even recognize it. So I'm aware that as, as, as I preach on things, maybe some, some of us who are struggling with a particular topic can really try to read or hear what I'm saying through the lens of what we already struggle with. And that makes it difficult for us. And I would say the biggest reason that we often hesitate on this is that we know that some people simply will not accept what the church teaches or what Jesus teaches, and they can fall away from the faith. They can stop coming to church based on what's preached. And some people even leave going from one church to another, looking for a church that agrees with them, rather than listening to what God wants to say. And that is another form of denial. Regardless of, of all of this, before I talk about this critical issue, it's really important for us to understand how Jesus sees the world. What's his posture toward the world? And that's what God reveals to us in today's gospel. The context here is that Jesus is going throughout the hillside, preaching, teaching, and healing the sick, driving out demons. He's ministering to God's people. And, it, and there's this part where in, in Matthew chapter 9 here where it says, at the sight of the crowds, there's probably hundreds if not thousands of people following him, listening to him preach. It says, Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Troubled, abandoned. This image about sheep, sheep that are disoriented, that have no direction, sheep that are often wounded and afraid, they're like sheep without a shepherd. This is really how God sees the world and how he approaches the world, that as he looks at the world, he sees sheep who are confused, who are hurting, who are wounded and broken, without direction. But the text, what it says is very important for us to see how is it that God responds to our plight in humanity? How is it that he sees us, right? It says, his heart was moved with pity for them. The Greek word here is very powerful. The Greek word denotes deep compassion, a visceral response. It's that being moved with compassion, being moved in the bowels, to have that pain of seeing the suffering of others. Now, we can experience this when we see a commercial, maybe for children in Africa who are starving, or maybe when we see one of our loved ones suffering, we can't do anything about it. There's that pain that's inside of our hearts because of the compassion that overwhelms up in us, or it wells up in us, and it moves us to action. That's what Jesus was experiencing when he sees the crowd, and I believe that's what he experiences when he sees the world today. It's really important because what was Jesus moved to do? 
When he saw humanity, what was he moved to do? He was moved to persevere in carrying the cross so that we might be saved, so that we might be rescued from our plight, so that he might live with us forever. But more proximately, what was he moved to do in this passage? The next line is very important. He's moved to call others into his compassion. He says, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. In other words, he's not saying to them, hey, everyone, I want you to watch how I treat the world. He says, I need your help. I need you to come along with me to see as I see, to love as I love, to bring healing and, and direction to this broken and lost world. And by baptism, each of us are called into that mission. We're called to have his compassion as we look out on the world. We're called to love people. We're called to bring about healing and restoration. And that's what the gospel is all about. To declare that we have a God who loves us regardless of what's going on in our life. That's the mission of Jesus. And that's really the, um, the, the perspective that I'm coming from today. is the compassion of the Lord. So my challenge to all of us today is as we look out on the crowds today, as we look out at people, businesses, cities, governments, including our federal government, celebrating Pride Day, which is ultimately a day which is, celebrates the rejection of God's beautiful plan for sex and marriage, I want to encourage all of us to see the world as troubled sheep abandoned without a shepherd. I want us to challenge us to have compassion on the confusion and disorientation that so many people are experiencing today. And yes, it's true, there are some people who know exactly what they're doing. They're promoting a Marxist agenda, an agenda that actually victimizes people, that hurts people. They know exactly what they're doing. They're anti-Christian. They do not want Christianity to thrive. But we have to also acknowledge that there are a lot of people who do not know what they don't know. And they sincerely believe, out of this false sense of compassion, that it's the right thing to do to support pride. And there are others who know that this is not correct, but out of fear of maybe losing their job or reprisal at work or maybe not getting business, that they don't, they don't speak up. Today, I don't want to talk um, about why is it that gender ideology is wrong. And we talked about this before. So gender ideology is this dualistic um, ideology or philosophy, which is a rejection of our embodiment as creatures. It's a rejection of humanity as male and female, which ultimately is a rejection of God who created us in his image. I'm not going to talk about why that's wrong, because we've preached on this before. I've talked about this in bulletin articles and book recommendations and other articles and even video recommendations over the years. My simple point this morning is to say this, contrary to what the crowds think, it's possible to hold the two following things as true at the same time. Number one, we can sincerely love those who struggle with same-sex attraction and gender identity. And at the same time, we can strongly reject the ideological activism that not only promotes sinful behavior, but victimizes the vulnerable and those who struggle with their sexuality. The first part is very true. We can absolutely love people who struggle. As Christians, we are called to love everyone regardless of their struggle, to accept everyone, to, to have compassion on everyone. And no matter what that kind of struggle is, that's who we are as Christians, is to manifest the love of Christ to people. And we need to remember in the context of our culture today, it's not a sin to experience same-sex attraction. It's not a sin to struggle with gender dysphoria or what used to be called gender identity disorder. That's not a sin. In fact, people who can experience this often live in a lot of shame and it's incredibly difficult for them. And they're going through a lot of intense suffering. They don't need our judgment. They don't need our condemnation. They need love and acceptance. Just like any one of us who's struggling need love and acceptance. At the same time, what happens is, is a challenge comes when a family member or a friend basically says to us, unless you approve of my lifestyle or my new partner or my new identity, you don't love me. 
Or they'll say, if, if you do not approve of my lifestyle, my identity, or my, or my, or my, my, my partner, then you are homophobe. You're transphobic. You're bigoted. You're hateful. You're a bad person. I don't know about you, but this kind of shame-based language directed at us from someone we love is one of the most painful things that we can experience because none of us who follows Christ wants to be labeled as that. None of us who follows Christ wants to be seen as someone who's not compassionate. And I believe this is actually one of the reasons why as Christians, we don't boldly live out what we believe that God has revealed to us, right? That what is, but is confirmed by science and, and reason. We're afraid of that kind of response. And so we pull back and we hide, which only perpetuates the confusion in our culture. One of the things we need to realize is that all of this is completely false. You can love people you disagree with. You can, in fact, love people who have a different worldview from you. In fact, we do that all the time. We love people we disagree with all of the time. Just look at your family, right? We, we, we can love people and not agree with them. And it's really important for us to remember because the word tolerance used to originally mean a Christian virtue, a virtue by which all of us Christians are able to live to forbear and endure the, 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 the lives of, or the people around us who disagree with us, who maybe mistreat us or maybe mistreat others. It primarily refers to persons, that we can be tolerant of persons who live differently. And it's a very important virtue as we live in a, in a kind of pluralistic culture today. But the word tolerance um, is, is actually being misused today. Archbishop Fulton Sheen said that we have an obligation, to be, I'm the paraphrase, but we tolerate people, but we don't tolerate bad ideas. We're not meant to tolerate error. And so as it used to look like a, a Christian virtue, what's, what's, being, what's being clear today is that people who are held fast by the ideology, they're using the word tolerance in a very different sense. For them, it's often, and not always, but it's often a rhetorical trick to get us to abandon our worldview in order to hold to theirs. That's not tolerant at all. In fact, this is one of the reasons why it seems as if so much of this is being forced upon us because people who are activists often have no interest in the Christian worldview being in the public square. That's why it often feels so tyrannical. It doesn't admit of tolerance of other people who hold different views. So what do we do when someone gives us an ultimatum about approving their lifestyle or their new identity? My encouragement is just a, a simple thing. It's just to, just to recognize it for what it is. It's an unreasonable request done out of confusion. It is completely unreasonable for people to demand us to reject the Christian worldview, a worldview that is confirmed by science and philosophy, in order to claim that we love them. It's unreasonable for us to abandon God's plan for sex and marriage in order for us to love them. It's just simply not true. We can love them out of the truth of knowing who, who they are in Christ as God's beloved son or daughter. John Paul II said it this way, do not accept anything as the truth if it lacks love, and do not accept anything as love which lacks truth. One without the other becomes a destructive lie. And there are a lot of destructive lies in our culture today. So my advice, if you have someone in your family or friends who, who is, is declaring a new lifestyle, or declaring a new identity, or is struggling in one way or another, is just simply this, accept them, love them, Befriend them, spend time with them. Do not shun them. Because after all, we can say something like this. As you love me and disagree with my worldview, disagree with me on this topic, I can love you and disagree on your understanding of the world, on your understanding of gender. See, we can love people that we disagree with. But it's important for us to stay in relationship with them because God wants us to show compassion to them. He wants them to see our love and our, and our, and our tenderness and our gentleness toward them. And when we love well, people will often re will kind of question, maybe I don't see things as clearly as I think I do. People need to see the compassion of Jesus in us. 
But as we love people who struggle, as we stay in relationship with them, we should still very much reject the ideology that promotes evil and victimizes the vulnerable, especially those who struggle with their, their sexuality. And there's a lot here, but I would simply want to say this one point in a special way. I want to speak to all of the men here on Father's Day. One of the responsibilities that God has given to us as men is to protect the innocent, especially women and children. And that means at times courageously calling out evil for what it is, resisting it, and seeking to protect those who are most vulnerable to its wickedness. It also means after doing that to make sure they're trying to build about a culture of, or a civilization of love, to build people up who have been affected by the ideology. And this is why I would say that we as men need to lead the charge in resisting the sexualization of children in our schools. We need to lead the charge in working to ban sterilizing cross-sex hormones for innocent children who don't know any better. And we need to lead the charge of resisting laws that would limit free speech on such topics so fundamental as our embodiment as creatures. These are acts of love and compassion. These are not acts of hate or bigotry. And so my brothers and sisters, as we worship our compassionate God, Jesus, who loves each of us in our brokenness and in our woundedness and our struggles, no matter what they are, as we worship that God, let's never allow anyone to try to convince us that it's not possible to love one and also disagree with them. Not only is this possible, but it's exactly what we're called to do.